Any self-respecting Land Rover enthusiast knows about the most famous Land Rover expedition of all time, and that is First Overland. And it's actually, it's actually properly stated, it's the, it's the Far East Expedition, London to Singapore Expedition, that was done in 1955. And what happened was some very um, outgoing and adventuresome Cambridge students in England got together with three of them, got together with three Oxford students in England, and they said, we've graduated, let's do something fun. Why don't we go and do an expedition, do the longest overland vehicular-based expedition to date. And that was to drive from London to Singapore in one shot with two Land Rovers and six guys, three guys in each vehicle. And you, as you can tell, what you're gonna see in a moment, the vehicles are not very large. So they said, well, how are we gonna do this? And they went out and got sponsorships because they had no money. They had just graduated from, from college. And they went to Land Rover first because they said, we need a vehicle. And they said, we need a vehicle that can do this. At the time, there were only two. There was, there was Jeep, there was the CJ, probably 2A, 3B at that time period and 3A, and then you have the Land Rover Series 1. And they went to Land Rover and Land Rover said, yes, we will give you two vehicles. They gave one to Oxford and one to Cambridge. The vehicle sitting behind me is the Oxford vehicle. About it is that these guys at a very early time bridge gaps between countries and prove that you can you can go out in the world even to dangerous areas and um, and travel through them and make friends and, and, and befriend the people there and it, it just embodies the whole idea of overlanding it's the, it's first overland it's it's the beginning they're the OGs of overlanding so um, so fast forward a bit the they do the expedition, smashing success. BBC makes a documentary out of it. Sir David Attenborough gets involved. He actually was the one who said, gave him the thumbs up in the beginning. They make this amazing movie. You can watch that movie to this day on YouTube, the original movie and uh, the whole, the whole um, documentary. And then after the expedition, everybody kind of went their separate ways and people kind of forgot about it. And what happened to the trucks? Apparently Cambridge's truck went on some expedition I think in the far in, in, in Morocco or something like that, or it was either it was either in Morocco or it was it was the Far East, but it, it went on some kind of expedition. I didn't really follow that that closely, and it was never heard from or seen again. The Oxford truck, although it disappeared, it was traceable because it ended up um, doing work on bird watching expeditions on Ascension Island in the South Atlantic, and of all places, but it was traceable because there was word of mouth that went through and apparently the expedition that they did on Ascension Island was very important for biological reasons. So it's Googleable and it was findable. So there was some tracing there and an incredible enthusiast in England, Adam Bennett, went out of his way and researched and researched and researched and found that it did ma indeed make it there and he went there. He went there and just started knocking on doors and looking around and trying to find Oxford because that was the last known whereabouts. And there was, there was pictures, there were pictures involved. There's a book of, the, of the, um, the bird watching society that did the expedition, but after that, they don't know what happened to it. And then they finally happened upon a person who knew that there was a person who worked for the expedition company who ended up with Oxford, but he actually, he used it for a number of years on Ascension Island, and then he retired on another island called, I think, St. Helena nearby, an even more, even smaller, more remote island. And he ended up going to that, he ended up taking, that, taking Oxford to that island, using it for his own personal use, and then he had a farm there, and then he passed away, and the farm went into new hands, and the person who owned the existing farm, went, then when they finally found out that this might be where it is, Adam went over there and knocked on the door, and he said, you know, we have a, we have a junk pile out back. I'm not sure if it's there, but there are some old parts back there, and here's the thing, follow me around. The, the most, there are only two Land Rovers in the world that have, um, a, a slot for the tent 
that went in between. It was a tarp that went in between the two vehicles. So it was the most telltale thing. And when Adam went back there, he saw the hard top sitting on the ground and he walked around the back side of it. And after all these years of search, he saw the signature tent slot, which is where they put the tarp in between the two vehicles. And that was their structure. And that's how he knew. And it was painted a different color. None of this showed up. None of the, none of the library, none of the decals showed up. And he was like, my God, I found it. And that, even more so than anything else, makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I almost burst into tears every time I tell that story. But he knew he found Oxford. Now it was in pieces. And he was like, my God, where's the rest of it? So there was the engine, engine was in it. And so a lot of parts were in there. It was fine. But he ended up, let me just get Jack out of here. So he ended up, he ended up um, saying, what happened to the rest of it? And it turns out there was another Series 1 Land Rover on the island that ended up with all the parts. So he was able to buy both of those parts. He really ended up trading a Defender to the farmer who said, this is great, I don't want money for it, but if you give me the Defender, that'd be awesome. He brought all the parts back to England, had a shop, put everything back together, and then they did a trip called Last Overland where Tim Slessor's grandson and a bunch of other, uh, the film crew um, went, and Adam went from Singapore to London. And then after that trip, they said, we need to share this incredible vehicle with the world. And they shipped it over to the United States and the Rovers Owners, Owners Association of Virginia spearheaded the whole effort to steward the truck all around the United States. And this is the third stop on its US tour. It went to the Maine Winter Romp, which is the largest Land Rover event in the country. It happens to take place in February in Northern Maine. I know a lot of questions about that, but it's an amazing event. And, and then it came from there to the Equinox Hotel for a couple weeks, and then I picked it up and brought it back here to central Vermont. Next, it will go to Boston, and then New Jersey to Bill Cooper's. Um, Bill Cooper's house, he's, a, he's an avid enthusiast, and then it will make its way back down to the Rover Owners Association of Virginia for their um, wintergreen event in early April. But here we have the amazing vehicle, and, and still has a painstakingly removed the paint um, that was over it to reveal the original decaling. So they had Mobile Gas, they had Mobile uh, as a sponsor, and they had obviously Land Rover. They had a bunch of other sponsors and things. And, um, and it's, it also has the, the most amazing, you know, they, they were able to keep the first Overland, um, the decaling on the back, which is really a paint, they painted that on there. And uh, it's, it's just an incredible condition. And what it does is this, guys, what this, really signifies is just how lasting a Land Rover is. All of these body panels are made of aluminum, Bermabrite. And um, it just goes to show you, I mean, even when the chassis had rusted away and you can replace the chassis, these vehicles live on almost as beings. You know, they, they live on, they can be recycled. They can be, and we're gonna get into a video soon with Vermont Overland about how I used all used parts in a junkyard basically to rebuild the Bumble in the most recent refit, just to prove that you can re keep these things going. You can rebuild them and keep them going for a lifetime. And, and that's kind of what First Overland and Oxford signifies. And he's here just for enthusiasts to enjoy. And, uh, and it, you just can't look at it. And the, you know, the big thing now is patina. Man, the OG of patina. This is where it all started. So pretty exciting. Driving, you know, driving, driving Oxford is any any series one. I've had three. I had a 52, 80 inch, and I've had two 107 station wagons, and they are they're rugged to drive. But what what you, you know, it's so easy to go out today and buy a brand new vehicle and have the thing drive great, but you're never going to get that feeling of attachment to the vehicle and to the to the road and to your surroundings, and it gives you such a sense of fulfillment to drive a vintage vehicle. You have to work harder, you have to, you have to know what you're doing shifting, you have to be aware of your surroundings. 
and it makes for a wonderful experience. So for those people considering buying a vintage 4x4, it's, it's an awesome thing. I own a 53 Willys, I've owned every conceivable old Land Rover, and I have the Bumble as a Land Rover now, which is a vintage vehicle in and of itself. That's over 25 years old now. And uh, it's just wonderful. And they have they just ooze with character. That's the thing, it just oozes with it. Every time you come out and even look at a vehicle like this, it makes you smile, and it gives you this overwhelming serotonin hit. I mean, you just like, you just feel wonderful when you see this type of thing because it harkens you back to an, an earlier, more simple time when, and a more adventurous time, a time when it wasn't about looking at your phone and Instagram and iPhone and everything else, which of course we're doing right now, posting on that, but it's like, it, it, it brings you back to a time when you were just connected with things and um, you had to use all of your wherewithal to, to get ahead and to, and to be adventuresome in life. And that really is what these type of expeditions signify, is that anything's possible when you do it, you, you do it smartly, you do it methodically, and you do it positively. And these guys had, you've seen the movie, they had incredible positive attitudes. You would think that three guys living in these things, they'd be at each other's throat in the first week and it would all be over. That didn't happen. These guys ended up to be lifelong friends to this very day. And Tim is still alive at 92 years old in England. Um, it's, just an, it's just an incredible thing. And so that, when people say, why would you drive a Land Rover? They're not very reliable, they're not very this. It's because of the insane amounts of character and that will keep you coming back to the table every time.